Welcome to uh, Building Sector Management online lecture number four. Tonight we're going to look at the project leadership um, and most probably after reviewing this session, we should be able to answer a few of the questions that you've got um, in assignment number two. All right, so uh, the first thing that we're going to have a look at is, is teams. Tonight we're going to just chat about teams and everybody always says there's no I in a team, but actually it is. And if you, if you have a quick look at it, it it's somewhere somewhere on the middle there in the A. Uh, let's see if I can get that going. Yep, so there it is. Um, there's definitely an R there. Um, not always easy uh, to work in a team, and I'm sure you guys uh, in other courses or other subjects that you're doing at the moment, you have to do teamwork. Um, when you come up with team dynamics, it's uh, always interesting to see exactly how it works. Um, especially, um, in large, larger teams. Larger teams makes it more difficult, and of course, with the moment you start doing things um, in distance, it makes it even more difficult. All right, so I see Philip, uh, Philip has joined us, and um, there's a little bit of a delay on Philip's side. Um, so we'll give Philip a second or so, we'll just continue, and uh, we'll give Philip a, a go a little bit later on. All right, so the uh, human processes that's involved in the project that, uh, that you're involved in, is basically everything around project management is not about the technical aspects, but it's rather about the uh, human processes that's involved in it. So uh, it's about assigning or aligning yourself with the uh, correct people. So it's all about that team management that you've got to do, and you have to get people that's got the right skills and make sure that they are going to provide you with the necessary resources in order to get going. All right, so the personal skills and attributes is really important because uh, if this guy, let's call this one number one, and number two have different personalities, obviously we're going to have a lot of clashes. And, and, and typically you'll see quite a bit of that happening on large project teams, especially if there's a bit of a bureaucracy, uh, a bureaucratic uh, type of management style versus an autocratic management style. So if somebody likes a lot of red tape, likes to follow processes, as opposed to somebody that's typically referred to as a, as a project management cowboy, uh, you'll see a lot of these clashes happening on big projects. Now, the thing about um, people on projects is, of course, that everybody's different. Uh, so nobody is exactly the same as anybody else, and personalities are different. And therefore, the, um, the result is that we cannot really predict with 100% accuracy what's going to happen. So it's a non-mechanical type of process. We can't really determine how people are going to act, and uh, we have to sort of take that into account. Right, so you have to plan, you have to think about things that are going to happen on a project. Um, the soft issue skills is always going to be in there when it comes to big projects. I'm not sure why I'm you know, drawing a lot of these little stick men tonight. It's every week I choose a little different object to draw. Last week it was a little face. This week it seems to be a little stick man. So there we go. All right, so Philip, I can see you've now completed the, um, the uh, audio setup. So if you want to click the talk button or maybe just give us an indication of uh, if you can hear us by clicking on the little icon that's uh, a tick mark yes or tick mark no. Or if you want to chat, uh, just type in the chat window. You might want to do that as well. Just want to see if you can hear us. And you can use any of the icons that you've got there. Just play with them and see if it, if it goes OK. If not, just in the type window, type us a little message and we'll take it from there. All right. So. Um, there's a lot of factors that we're going to have to play with, and these factors are always, of course, manageable. And the more, in, the more experience you get, the better you get at managing these factors. It's like Gary Player. Julia, do you know who Gary Player is? Um, no. So Gary Player used to be a South African golfer that uh, won quite a few um, uh, tournaments. Uh, Gary, uh, so Gary Player used to say that the more he practices, the more he, he, the luckier he gets. You know? So it's the same with project management and people management. Is of course the easier it, uh, the more you do it, the easier it gets. And um, of course, um, in large organisations, large projects, um, influence is always going to play a role. So 
It's all about the political games. You look at Julia Gillard and uh, Tony Abbott playing with each other. Um, in Parliament, that's exactly what we're going to do in large projects. You'll see that um, it's about the information that you command, how easy it is uh, to see how it goes. All right, so the authors that you might want to go at and um, have a Google app is called Blake and the Thorn. They, uh, they published some work a few years ago about the personalities and behaviors and how different people are differently orientated towards tasks and uh, social orientation. So typically, it says there that uh, there's different classes of people. Uh, so obviously, there's an imbalance, there's a balanced type person, and you can sort of position yourself in the different areas where you want to be. So if we say uh, a task orientation, so over here, this on this side, this would be low, and on that side, that would be high. Um, so typically, this arrow goes this way, uh, and there we go. So if you've got a a one on the one scale over there. Obviously, it means that you are sort of um, uh, an avoider, trying not to work. And also, remember on this side as well, this is low. And on this side, this over here is high. So the same rule applies over here. So this arrow goes up that way. Um, and if you sort of low on everything, it means that you don't want to play and you don't want to work. And typically, this might not be the best person to have on your team. But they are always going to be there, so you have to choose perfectly. All right, so on the opposite scale, you can also have somebody that's sort of a, uh, a person that you maybe can pay extra money for because this guy's really flexible. He can really uh, fit into any type of situation. He might be available to uh, work at, uh, at any time. While uh, somebody that's sort of in the middle is going to be the political manipulator. He's going to be able to maneuver the different rules and everything that's happening on the project and uh, make sure that he gets the best out of each of the situations, um, depending on the different situations. There's always um, somebody that's more orientated to work, and this would typically be the uh, taskmaster who sits over there. And uh, the taskmaster is obviously somebody that's going to be uh, uh, orientated towards work. So you'll see there that it's high on this side, where it says it's task orientated. However, on the social side, let's just draw another line over there. There's our social side. So there's L over there, and there's I, H over there. This guy is going to be all work and no play. Um, sometimes it's a good thing to have people like that on your team. Um, try and get more balanced, it's not always easy. Alternatively, um, and, and each and every project has to have one of these, um, that's the one that's going to be the socializer. Um, Julia, I'm not sure if you've worked on, on different projects uh, before, but typically um, there will always be a joker that's out there and he's going to make sure that everybody stays um, entertained and he's going to make sure that there's always going to be fun on a project. <laughs> These guys can typically cost a few bucks on the side. Yep. You should have them because they just make it a, a lot better. Um, and you have to laugh about the work that you do. Um, uh, looking at the university, the bureaucracy that we have over there, if you don't smile about it, you know, obviously it's not going to be a very enjoyable atmosphere at all, so you have to make it um, as enjoyable as you possibly can. All right, so in terms of principles of leadership, um, can you become an entrepreneur? Can you become a leader? Is it something that's, uh, that's sort of inbred or is it sort of instinct? Um, those are the questions that you typically want to think about when you answer that question. Um, so what's the difference between uh, leadership and management? You know, which of these two can you acquire by experience? Or can you do both of them by experience? Um, and obviously, there's, uh, there's different ways. So some of these actions requires direct input. Right? So you think about it, and therefore, um, when you think about it, you come up with a plan, and therefore, it's an orchestrated process. And from the plan, you can get some kind of down the line or downstream effect. Right? And that's typically what you want to do. You want to make sure that, that you do achieve what the program goals are. And that typically, we'll see there the plan and implementation of that specific plan is really important. 
So from a uh, leadership and management point of view, uh, Julia, what do you think? The plan and implementation, is it more on a management side or is it more on a leadership side? Um, I think more management tends to plan and leadership tends to implement. That's how I would see yep, it. So I don't know whether that's right. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it, it, there's no right or wrong answer there. <laughs> Philip, I can see you've got your video camera on. Uh, can you hear us at the moment? If you can, uh, at some point, just give us a, a little bit of a signal there, maybe a hand or something. You can click on the icons um, that, that's just above the... Uh, uh, okay, there we go. We've got a hand there. All right, so that means you can uh, at least hear us. Uh, can you just click on the talk button and say something? Can you hear me, Joshua? Yes, there we go, Philip. How's it going? Oh, very good, thank you very much. I'm just getting used to some of this technology here and adjusting the speaker um, setups to hear, to hear you a bit clearer. All right, no, that's great. Uh, it, it takes a while to get used to these things, and um, you know, we're still in the process, as I said. It's new for everybody, so we'll uh, we'll go along the line, and you know, if you get if you get stuck, just let me know. All right. Thanks, Joshua. All right, great stuff. All right, so let's go back to our little slide there, uh, accountable for the effort and the total effort. Uh, so what's the difference between uh, accountable or let's say, can which of these two can be delegated? Can we delegate accountability? Can we say we can delegate accountability as opposed to delegating responsibility? So we've got two, accountability that are there, and we've got responsibility. I don't think you can delegate accountability. Well, maybe you can. You can definitely All delegate right, so responsibility. No, yeah. Yep, there we go. That's, a, that's exactly right. It looks like I'm suffering from some kind of disease if I look at my handwriting on the... <laughs> <laughs> on the screen there, so either that or too much alcohol over the weekend. But um, yeah, it's it must it's it's a process trying to get to uh, teach yourself those, how to write on a tablet. Those but, lit chocolates, uh, Joshua. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's those. That's exactly. Well, I was wondering if somebody was going to read that, but yes, that's exactly right. So it's all the chocolates that's uh, this <laughs> giving me that sugar rush. So you're right, Julia. There, um, <laughs> yeah, it's accountability. You cannot delegate accountability. Uh, but you can delegate that responsibility. The easy way to remember that is A sits on top of R, and therefore R can be given away. So the same with our leadership and management. These guys are going to lead the uh, the project. They're going to lead by example, making sure that everybody sees exactly what they do. Now, if we look at some examples in the industry, uh, not all project managers have the best examples to set. You know, they uh, they sort of have a checkered part. Josh, I think we've lost your audio. I'm good. I thought it was me. No, no, it's uh, sorry. That... Yeah, have you got it back yet? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Hmm. Okay, that's an unhappy face. Yeah, there's something happening with Telstra in this area. So uh, yeah, if I if I drop out again, I'll be back shortly. Don't go anywhere. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to be um, very patient with the guys from Telstra, as I say. All right, so uh, the different theories that, uh, that we are going to discuss, there's basically three different theories that we'll uh, have a look at. And for your assessment item, you'll, uh, you'll have to go through each of these, do a little bit of more research and see if you can find information about this. So the first one is basically a sort of theory, and this is where we've got a... Uh, a project manager that, that's got uh, many, many years of experience, for instance, and this guy is just going to force his ideas down onto the 
team. So this is quite an, an autocratic type management style that uh, that's uh, that's out there. Uh, we do see quite a lot of them. Um, how do you think an authoritarian uh, type of manager works with a labor union, for instance? With a who, sorry? A labor union. Oh. Oh, yeah, probably not real well. Yeah, if you uh, if you think, yeah, go for it, then. I was going to say, unless you use part of the labor union, because that pretty much describes them, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it was it was actually a trick question, so yeah, well spotted there. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting to see the the uh, interactions of autocratic people on uh, on construction sites or any type of project for that matter. Um, Who's worked in a situation, Philip, you guys, have anybody worked in a situation where you had to deal with an autocratic type of person? No one? No, not, not me personally, no. Yeah. I, I, I had a, when I worked in the Middle East, I had a guy that, uh, that was, he was really good at his job, uh, but he made a, he made a real, um, he made real sure that everybody knew exactly what he wanted, and uh, at any point in time, if you were on the wrong side of him, um, you know, you, you sort of knew it immediately. Eventually, that project ended in a little bit of a disaster. I had to uh, sort of resign from the company because I was unhappy about the uh, the leadership style. So, yeah, it, it has effects on, on the different types of people that you've got in your team. So the assumptions that we have from the uh, autocratic leader is that all people are going to be lazy and they don't want to work. Um, and therefore, um, if we go back to our uh, Blake and Mouton type uh, scenario, you'll have to see all right, if all people are lazy, therefore they are one-one type uh, relationships. And uh, those are the things that we have to think about. The next assumption is that all people would dislike and avoid trying to work. And they're going to try and, and scoot away from a responsibility, passing it on uh, to different people, see if they can send it on. And then, of course, nobody wants to take any kind of decision for any of the responsibilities. So instead of making the decisions yourself, you just pass it on. And the easiest way um, to get around an authoritative or autocratic type manager is to make sure that you uh, ask for a lot of information, make sure that you try on your side to be uh, collaborative, and try and circumvent the autocratic uh, management style over there. So you can see there's the, the management style. I've tried to show it there in that slide there. Um, very direct, right? So strict instructions, uh, the supervision uh, has small parameters. So that's the instruction. And you can only work within that small little area over there. Um, if you don't perform, um, obviously, there's going to be some effect on it. And of course, there's always going to be a constant drive. So typically with these authoritarian type of people, uh, you'll see that these guys, they sometimes become real good entrepreneurs as well. You know, So they've really got drive. They really push the business out there. Uh, they get it up and running. They get it started really well. But when it comes to management, it sort of falls over down the line. So when it starts growing, the harvesting process of that business doesn't always pan out the way that it should. All right, so I can see Zane has joined us as well. Welcome, Zane. Let us know if you can uh, hear us just by showing us a hand or anything like that. And, uh, and we'll, uh, all right, so there we go. Zane's got a hand up. Excellent, great stuff. Welcome to uh, tonight's session. So, Philip, I see you still have your hand up. You might just press that button again to take it down. You'll see that little red one next to your name will disappear. All right, so uh, let's move on to the uh, next slide. The next leadership style that we're going to look at is a theory why. This one is all about participation and collaboration, um, making sure that everybody's uh, in line. So typically, there's our leader. Is our fearless leader is going to be there, and let's stick to just little circles over there. There's our team members. Yeah. The collaboration process is, of course, we're going to keep on asking all of these guys. So basically, we've got two-way communication. That arrow goes there, that arrow goes there. And of course, there's always the constant uh, questions about, yeah, do you think this is a good idea? Will this work? Participation is really important to 
uh, a participative leader. So the assumptions that typically uh, are associated with these guys is that people are self-directed. Uh, so that they can start on their own, that the project will run well. Uh, it's not always the case, though. Uh, so in many instances, these managers will um, uh, take the flat if the people are, in fact, not self-directed or self-motivated. Um, they tend to trust people a lot easier. Um, and sometimes on a big project, you need a little bit of uh, autocratic management style to get things going. Uh, so let's think about the military, for instance. If, uh, if the military did not have a chain of command, obviously um, things would turn out quite differently. And uh, the same on the construction side. So there cannot be too many cooks in the kitchen. At some point, somebody has to take uh, responsibility for it. Now, the problem with the self-directed and self-motivated uh, type of people is when we look at our little Gantt chart, there's our project. Uh, if we look at our project, uh, typically these timelines that we have, the deadlines that we have on our projects, they tend to swish past very easily because uh, if they're not controlled and if there's not an uh, autocratic management style, it tends to fall over. So in which type of organization do you think a participative management style would work best? Any, any, uh, any clues from anybody? I think it works uh, so well. That. Yeah, go for it, Philip. Sorry, I was just going to say that I think my, I think um, most situations that participative works well, but it's up to the manager to assess who needs more towards theory Y and who needs more towards theory X. It's a, it's about assessing each personality that you're dealing with. All right, so that's really that's a, that's really a valid point there that Phillips brought up there. So let's say, for instance, we've got uh, different types of personalities on our team. So let's just put these guys each in a different box, um, depending on the type of people that you've got in your team. Obviously, your management style will change. Um, if you've got somebody that, so let's call it high maintenance, uh, you'll approach it a little bit differently. Uh, if you have people that are self-directed and self-motivated, obviously you'll give them a little bit more rope uh, so that they can uh, perform and uh, get out there and get things done. Um, the styles, uh, trusting, right, and uh, sort of all about guiding, providing guidance in terms of uh, where we want to go as opposed to orders. Right? So uh, instead of um, giving people direct orders, the participative style would typically be, uh, let's think about doing this a different way, or alternatively, have you thought about uh, trying this different technology or this different methodology. Um, of course, always trying to positively motivate the people and uh, see if they can get onto that. All right, so for the assessment item, you'll, uh, you'll do a little bit of research on, the, on this theory as well so that you can uh, further expand on what we've given us there. If we look at the, uh, the last one that we're just going to touch on, um, uh, Z, theory Z, this is typically from uh, the Japanese, so they are they really are driven in terms of quality, so zero defect is really important for them. Um, I did a small project for Toyota in South Africa, and um, at one stage they had a rule that said that if they could not fit the whole plan or schematic for a new model onto an A3 um, piece of paper, then they are doing it wrong. So uh, the whole schematic would be on there. Uh, obviously, they used microfish technology to make it a little bit more stretchable, uh, but that's the, the idea behind them. So it's all about that zero defect, making sure that everything is covered at every point. If we, however, um, it would seem that it's not always as successful if you think about all the recalls that we've had in the automotive industry in the last couple of months. Um, so really in interesting to see um, cars being recalled uh, two or three years later. So it doesn't always work. The other one that's also really important for us, just in time. Has anybody tried a just in time principle on a construction site? 
Um, can you guys give me a idea by saying yes or no? What was the question? Sorry. Uh, have you have you ever tried the just in time principle on a large project? Um, I'm always trying to meet deadlines. Oh well, well just in time means that uh, you don't keep stock basically. So let's say for instance your your timeline calls for deliveries at certain points. The delivery will be just you know a few hours before that uh, the resource is required. Um, as opposed to if you work in Africa, for instance, uh, you know that's not a good principle to uh, try and attain because deliveries are notoriously late. So uh, yep, it's it's good to try and meet those deadlines. The just-in-time principle means that um, everything that you do will be delivered just before you need the resource. Philip, have you have you got any experience on this? Uh, you've you've worked on a few things before. Um, have you got any experience of adjusting time type of principle? Uh, just click the talk button again. Yep, there we go. Yep, go for it, Philip. Or oh, Zane, I see Zane, you've also got your microphone active. Yeah, I've done, done some with uh, Fletchers in New Zealand when you're working on very, very tight sites. But if you get a problem and it doesn't turn up on time, it's good fun. Mm. You know, it's, 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 an, it's a nifty idea. It's not always possible to, uh, you know, attain that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that just happens. All right, so those are the three theories that, that you guys will have to have a look at for that assignment. If we move on to the next uh, slide, le uh, leading professionals, um, obviously the, the more professional the team is that you're going to lead, the more uh, expertise and more experience you'll need in how to deal with them. Um, if you uh, have a bunch of laborers on site that's quite happy to take orders, um, it's a lot easier managing them because you just issue the orders and off they go. All right, once again, we'll think about the military. Uh, that's a good example where um, the orders are followed from the superiors um, in an organization like, for instance, the university. It's not always as easy as that because it's more collaborative. It's uh, a lot of people that's highly qualified, supposedly. Um, it becomes more difficult to uh, get them to do what you actually want them to do. So you have to go uh, about it in a different way, making sure that they actually want to do what you want to do, um, sort of manipulate them and uh, see if you can get uh, get them to perform. I think the most important one on this slide is there is that we do not describe the how. Uh, so we tell you, typically we'll tell the professional person, this is what we want. So if we think about an engineering design, we'll typically give a deadline. All right, so there's our deadline again, and we'll tell the uh, professional designer that at that point in time over there, that is when we'll need our design package to be complete. How he gets there is absolutely up to him. All right, so you can either follow that route, or alternatively, if we uh, take another route, he can just go straight to that line. So that's that's the easy way for him, and uh, we're not going to make sure we're not going to tell them exactly how to do it. We're just going to tell them what to do. Um, recognizing the self-esteem, professionalism, uh, pride is really important when it comes to leading professionals. Um, egos important, making sure that everybody understands who's who on the team. Um, typically, um, the more experienced people have in these things, uh, the more focused they become on. Uh, on the egos and stuff like that. So, if you don't, uh, if you haven't encountered that, please uh, just put up your hand, tell me, and uh, we'll, we'll think of an example there. All right. So there's a pro process that we have to think about when it comes to managing these uh, these different functions. Uh, once again, uh, the task behavior on this side high, and on this side low, and the same on this axis over here. So when it comes to um, a relationship in terms of functionality. Uh, it's difficult to understand where people fit into the different scheme of things if you don't, uh, if you haven't worked with them on different pro uh, projects before. So it's always going to be 
uh, a requirement for our project manager, the professional team to make sure that they understand exactly where the different people fit into. So is it going to be a hard task and high relationship? Is it going to be uh, a hard task and ro low relationship type scenario? Or alternatively, is it going to be a low task and low relationship? Right, so all of these things have to start playing a role in the type of management style that you're going to uh, execute on your specific project. Um, and these projects will tend to change. Right, so a low task, low relationship, might move that way and alternatively it might move that way as well depending on the situation. In theory it actually should only go in one direction. So it should start with a high task, low relationship. It will sort of grow along that line over there um, as the project increases in complexity our relationship will grow. Um, the focus on the task will continue and of course once the task is attained we'll see that towards the end of the task there's a, a low relationship and a low task as well because we've now completed it and it's ready for us to move on. All right, so over there you can see at that point in time the relationship is still immature and at that point in time towards the end of the, the contract we can see that uh, it becomes more mature just because of what we've been through and uh, what we've achieved. All right, so again, um, Let's just see if we can get a new page going here. Last week I showed you a slide talking about the uh, opportunity for influence on a project. Uh, so there's our two lines over there. Um, and over there there's phase one of the project, phase two, the different stage gates that we have. Uh, so these are the different stages that we've got on a specific project. So stage one might be representation of uh, the idea generation phase. Step two might be uh, design. Step three might be detailed design packages. Step four might be execution of that specific project. So if we look at this line over here, let's see if I can get that uh, a different color. So if we look at this line over there, let's call that the blue line. That is our cost line. All right, so early in the project, to make a change, let's say this red line, let's see if I can change that color again. Um, of course, this is uh, opportunity. Now I've got difficulty spelling tonight. All right, so there's the opportunity for change on our project. So early on in the project over here, it's really easy for us to make changes and the cost associated with that change is quite low. All right, so there's our opportunity for change, the cost is low. As the project progresses, all right, so remember this is time and time's going to do that. Um, as the time progresses, the project moves forward, you're going to see that the opportunity to inflict change on our specific project is going to decrease while the cost to, to do that change is going to increase. And somebody like Philip, you're, a, you're an engineer, you'll, uh, you'll have personal experience of this. And uh, by the time we come to the last phase of our project, let's say commissioning, uh, to make a change over there is going to be really expensive. Right, so you can see that the cost for making a change in the last phase of a project becomes really prohibitive and expensive for us. Oh, so there's something else that you can think about. Uh, anybody, everybody happy with that? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, uh, yep. Let's just go back to our slide presentation. So that's that's the the same principle applied to the um, management functions. It's relationships. We start out immature and we move to a mature field over there. And the same with our project, the cost influence type relationship. So if we think about the um, hierarchy of needs. Maslow has been around. I'm sure everybody's heard of him before. Um, he said that there's different levels uh, for people um, to sort of reach levels of self-actualization eventually. These are levels of, of needs that they've got different, different needs. So 
basically the lowest level of needs would be uh, psychological. So typically stuff like food and sleep and uh, let's say security and protection would be in the lowest level. And as soon as this level has attained, people will start jumping up to the next level. So this is where we can say, all right, we, we're going to try and move away from um, the basic stuff and now we, we want the extra level. And as you move along through life and you'll see uh, typically when you reach uh, uh, higher ages, uh, you want to reach a point of self-actualization. And this is where you can say, uh, all right, I have decided that I've worked in the industry for 40 years. I want to formalize my years and years of study. And you want to go and do a PhD or alternatively uh, and build a nice house for yourself at the coast. And that becomes your level of self-actualization. So do a little bit of research on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, there's another one on the next slide that works really well with uh, Maslow as well, and that's Adlerfer's uh, existence-related uh, uh, theory, the ERG theory. So have a look at those two. Um, they will be able to help you to do a little bit of research on them on exactly how um, these different management styles uh, link in together with the different types of people that you're going to have on site or on your project. It doesn't need to be a construction project at all. It can be any type of project. Um, so you can see there, what I've tried to show you over here is in terms of Maslow, there's our, uh, our levels for Maslow, psychological needs, safety, social esteem, and self-actualization. Um, Adlifer says, all right, yep, it's sort of in that line. Uh, he's going to group it together in growth. Um, relatedness and existence. So the basic stuff over here is just uh, this is what I need uh, to make an existence. All right, so protection, house, food, basic stuff. Um, and then of course over there, there's our, uh, so let's just say this is the basics. And now we start talking about the people stuff. All right, so relatedness, it's all about people being accepted into a different team making sure that, you, uh, that you're included. And of course, then the last one is growth. And this is more towards the self. And this is where um, Adlifer says, all right, in that case, uh, this is where self-development now starts playing a big, big role. All right, so when you do those questions, uh, the question will specifically ask you about different management styles, team building and monitoring of team performance. This is where you want to focus on that. If we think about project managers, these guys typically have power on a project because of, number one, their position. Um, it might be because of the project charter that gives them that authority. Um, or it might be because of some legal aspects. Or some legal aspect on the project, they're responsible in terms of the contract. Um, and that gives them the authority to make that decision. Uh, so typically uh, policies, any kind of decisions that need to be made uh, based on the uh, official position of the company, where the project needs to go, procedural decisions. Um, if this goes wrong, we can go that way. If that goes wrong, we can go that one. And uh, that's the basically the legal justice or the legal base for that power. The uh, reality or the authority power sits over there, and this is because of the expertise that this guy has. Um, He's been working in power stations, for instance, for the last 30 years. Therefore, he's got a lot of experience, and uh, he's got a lot of technical knowledge, and people will follow him because he's got that, uh, that technical knowledge. So the question that you have to answer is, uh, for a good project manager, do you want somebody that's a technical ex expert, or do you want somebody that's sort of focused on a specific industry, or do you want somebody that can manage people? Right, so those are typically the types of questions that you have to think about uh, when it comes to the selection of our project manager. And the last type of project manager power that we've got the authority over there is because of the project charter. And this is, has to do with the uh, approval. So what kind of value of the project is there to sign for? What's the uh, accountability? What's the responsibility? What can be delegated? What cannot be delegated? And I've tried to give you a little bit of an idea there with this slide. So have a look at this and see if you can um, analyze this a little bit further and come up with a nice uh, way of uh, discussing 
the different types of authority that you might encounter from a project manager. Also, of course, the different types of uh, characteristics that makes a good project manager. So the uh, formal authority, we've spoken about that because of the position and the title, um, the reward power that can be uh, executed. So let's say, for instance, you work on a big project, and we'll see this in, in large organizations as well. Um, for instance, in university, if you if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back type of situation, um, making sure that you have positive or powerful allies in the organization. That's always going to be a good thing. Um, get people on your side, people in power on your side. So remember when we started out right in the beginning, I said, think about this as a political game. It's a chess game that everybody's playing. Um, so uh, make sure that you've got your allies. Uh, penalty power, the power that's associated with um, in, impacting negatively on a project. So let's say if you don't perform, this is going to happen. It's negative. Therefore, people are scared about it. Um, because they're scared, they might perform better. And so positives and negatives to that one. And you have to think about how different people will react to that. Uh, in that, you, you've all seen in the local press the uh, radio station DJs that, uh, that played the hoax and sort of went the wrong way. So you have to sort of, that it sort of touches on what we're discussing here tonight. It's um, that perception that somebody failed in a position or that they failed in their duty that sort of brought on something else. So think about those contexts as well when you answer that question. We've spoken about the uh, expert power because of the expertise and the technical knowledge. And then, of course, the last one there is if you're friends with the project manager or if they're close buddies, everybody sees you in the same sort of block. Um, it's nice to have a big brother that's on your side. Remember what we said, powerful allies um, is always going to go a long way. So what is authority worth in terms of projects? Um, if we think about uh, the power has to come from somewhere. Right? So think about where the power comes from. Right? And there might be different ways. We've discussed that uh, in the previous slide. So it might be because of the project charter. It might be because of uh, uh, the contract. It might be because of the position. And that sort of implies authority to our project manager. And those two together will give us influence. Right? So we need to understand where our project manager gets the influence from. And if you're in that role, if you understand where the power comes from, where the uh, perceived authority sits, it's a lot easier to manage and influence people. Well, so different ways, Zane, you joined us a little bit late, but we spoke about um, autocratic leaders and participative leaders right in the beginning. Um, typically, in a construction site, you'll see a more top-down type scenario. There's our top-down scenario. It looks like that. We'll have our project manager up there um, in a organization that's uh, more participative. It might look something like that, where we have different levels, uh, a few more people making decisions up there, a little bit more collaborative. Um, depends on the situation. You have to come up with the right solution for the right type of project that you're working on. So when it comes to the motivation aspect, how do we motivate people? Um, it's, it's, once again, a process that you have to go through. Uh, what's the opportunity that you have available? What's, uh, what's the future prospects? Um, can you keep people there? Um, in Australia, it's really important to have a nice, solid job at the moment. Uh, uh, the economy isn't in such a great shape. If we think about the first assessment that you guys have just completed, I think the reason behind that assessment that I wanted you to think about is what's changed in the last 10 years. Uh, so if we look at um, 2002 to 2006, really uh, prosperous years. The industry really boomed. Uh, then the crash happened, sort of 2007, 8, 9. Uh, things really slowed down. Lots and lots of unemployment. And uh, it's only starting to start picking up now. So the security that we have over there, um, that's always going to be a, a trump card to play with. Right? So um, if you can do a better job, 
is it some kind of added security for you in order to keep the job at the end of the day. Different ways, um, it's all about the information that you have, making sure that people know what you know. Um, if you know a little bit more, it puts you in a better position. Um, a company that I used to work for had the loader that said information is power, and uh, that's always going to be true. So the more information you have available, the better the decisions are going to be that you're going to be able to make. Um, the more informed uh, you're going to be, the less risk you're going to take because you understand where it's going from. Um, make sure that you, uh, yep, make sure that you've uh, put people in positions that uh, that they can sort of act, all right, and um, don't don't promote them past their uh, point of confidence. Right? So there's a, there's the Peter principle. I think you guys actually have access to uh, do stuff on the screen if you like. Uh, there's a little, uh, there should be a, a little a range of icons right next to the, the whiteboard if you want to draw stuff on the screen or draw my attention to something. Just grab the mouse and grab the pen and, and start drawing. Um, but back to that point, uh, place them in positions where they are trained, um, you know, or trained for or alternatively make sure that they're in position where they are comfortable. Right? They've done it before, they know exactly how to do it and uh, they are happy to perform those tasks. If you take somebody out of their comfort zone, they might not perform well at first, they'll have to develop into that role. Um, a few different soft techniques that you can, can do. Um, make sure that you, when you put your promise down, you can actually perform and that you can actually deliver on it. Um, and if there's anything that's gone wrong, Try not to think about uh, punitive action. You know, don't try and hunt people down. Rather, think about, oh, okay, so this has happened now. How are we going to solve it? In many instances, it doesn't really help to go and find who the guilty party is. Uh, it just helps to go and find a solution and say, all right, well, this has happened. How can we fix it? And then uh, towards the end of the project, you can maybe think about training and, and making the process a little bit better. So. When it comes to the motivation of people, make sure that you've got your KPIs. Over there. I hate the word KPIs. I'm not sure how effective it is. Make sure that you've got those performance expectations written down, that it's well defined. Um, roles and response, in my experience, and you know, anybody can comment on that, but in my experience, the roles and responsibilities on a project is typically the area where things fall over the easiest. Um, if people don't know exactly what they're supposed to do, if they don't understand exactly what their roles and responsibilities are, um, things fall over and stuff don't get done. Right? So if you've got two sets of subcontractors on site, there's a little bit of an overlap. Typically, that overlap is where nothing is going to happen. So make sure that you have the same with your team, um, that you manage that process well. And then, of course, if you can stimulate that uh, culture of participation over there, um, make sure that uh, people get an opportunity to take part if it's their role to take part. Obviously, if you're uh, going to uh, outsource some of the functions on your team uh, for technical reasons, you don't want um, other decision makers to uh, influence where you're going with that. All right, so let's uh, think about external members. And uh, typically, this is where it comes to uh, you know, challenging subcontractors or challenging suppliers, and uh, something that I learned really early on in my career is a small little sentence that I picked up from one of the first project managers that I worked with. And he always, whenever he ran into trouble with one of these uh, subbies or suppliers, he used to say that, um, in the view of our continuing business relationship, don't you want to consider your claim or your invoice or whatever the problem was at that point? And typically, things would turn around, and you know, because for subcontractors, it's all about the long view. All right, so and the same with people, it's all about what can we achieve at that point. So if it's a little bit horrible over there in the first part, and you can just survive that and go on to the nice parts over there. So there's our. Let's see if I can do a palm tree. There's our palm tree. If you can survive and get onto the palm tree phase of the project. Yep, that's where you want to go. Uh, so make sure that you give that recognition. If somebody's done something great, if there's been a saving on a project, make sure that everybody knows about it. If you have a, 
a penalty for late completion on a project? Why don't you have an incentive for early completion? Uh, so those are always the things that you're going to think about um, when it comes to uh, team membership. So uh, the team building principles, um, how are we going to get our team going? So if you think about, it, let's say you're going to be involved in a brand new project, there's a kickoff meeting at the beginning. Uh, kickoff meeting is actually code for let's just get uh, a lot of alcohol out there and see if we can uh, get our team together and see if they can socially bond. And uh, that gets to that group cohesion. Right, so small wins, that's where it typically always starts. Uh, depending on the type of project, you might have different approaches to that. Typically in the construction industry, uh, definitely all the projects that I've worked on before, um, the social interaction between people tend to develop towards the end of the project really well. You've worked long hours together. Um, after work, everybody goes out for a drink. Um, the other professional type projects that you've worked on, it might be different. It might be a supply-only situation and you might not be uh, required to do um, any kind of social events. Um, make sure that there's common goals. Right? So if, there, if the whole team, there's our team members, if all of them sort of work towards a single goal over there, it makes it a lot easier um, for everybody to pull together. And uh, of course, the security and protection, I've got your back type of situation um, needs to be there. I think one of the newer ones, and this really started coming out uh, after the Enron scandal 2000, 2001, uh, transparency in decisions. Right? So if there's a decision that needs to be made, make sure that you're nice and transparent. Um, if you're going to appoint a subcontractor, let's say we've got a, a number of subcontractors over there, um, make sure that you uh, appoint the right one. Um, not because he's your buddy or something, but because he's got the best uh, attitude towards the project, he can deliver the best deal, depending on what the uh, selection criteria was for that uh, the, uh, year or for, the, for that specific project. Um, there's our role definitions again. We've spoken about that one before. And then, of course, uh, mutual integrity and credibility. All right, so uh, profit's not a dirty word. Um, contractors are allowed to make it, subcontractors as well. So make sure that you've got that integrity and credibility um, going at all times. So talking about delegation, um, we can encounter different types of weaknesses when it comes to delegation. Right? So let's say uh, it might be for our delegator, it might be difficult to delegate the task because um, he likes doing things on his own. He knows that if he does it himself, things get done. And therefore, in a team environment, it's sometimes really difficult for our delegator to say, all right, I'm going to take my team members and give away these tasks and make them responsible for that. Right, so remember that we can give away the responsibility. As Julia pointed out right in the beginning, we can uh, delegate that, but the accountability remains with the delegator. He sits on top, he remains, or he remains accountable for that to, um, let's say, the board of directors or the uh, project sponsor at the end of the day and he needs to, to uh, make sure that his team performs accurately. Uh, some other weaknesses is that our delegator might expect all the team members to be mini-me's. Uh, so I'm not sure if you guys remember the mini-me principle where um, if you're not exactly the same as I am, uh, you're not going to make it. Um, so that's really one of the problems that we, that we face as well. Uh, inexperience. Um, inexperience in terms of delegation. That's what I wanted to say there is um, you have to let go. So the, the, the harder you clench your fist, the more it's going to get away. And uh, therefore, that inexperience, it goes over time. So the more you do it, the easier it gets to let go of that uh, responsibility. And at the end of the day, the project manager cannot do everything. He's basically the guy that's just shifting the stuff around. And then, of course, the lack of confidence. Um, early career project managers uh, typically will have that, uh, or somebody that's been appointed to a really, really senior position without the necessary experience, without the necessary industry experience, might lack that confidence um, to make uh, things go right. 
for uh, the person accepting the responsibility, it's a little bit different. Um, we've got the same type of uh, issues there, inexperience, incompetence, don't have the right skill set, haven't done it before, um, not sure I can do it. Those are the things that you need to make sure that you address well. Um, the avoiding responsibility, um, there's different reasons for that. As a project manager or as a delegator, you need to make sure that you're well aware of that situation um, and can manage that process. And then, of course, overloaded. Uh, in some instances, um, remember when we spoke about the Blake and Maton, um, uh personality matches or personality relationships, we've got people that's all about work and not about uh, a balanced approach to work and play. So make sure that when you have a person like that on your team which says yes to everything, that you don't overload them. Right? People in that position tends to be little sponges. Right? So if you use a lot of experience use a lot of imagination that, that's a sponge and they just keep on taking on um, responsibility and it becomes too heavy and at some point the whole process falls. Um, and then of course the situation as well. Uh, our cowboy, remember we spoke about our cowboy, there's our cowboy, it's a one man show policy. I make all the decisions, uh, nobody else gets to make any decisions. Intolerance for any kind of mistakes. Um, very difficult. This is particularly where an autocratic manager uh, or autocratic management style starts coming into play. Uh, there's a total intolerance for um, performance. Right? You either do it this way or you go and do it on a different project. And uh, there's our very famous one again, roles and responsibilities that's not clearly defined. All right, so uh, if we think about the uh, positive and negatives, um, there's high performance efficiency, um, and this should actually be team performance, so somehow I managed to delete my own heading over there. So let's see if I can get team performance in there. Right, so there's our heading back in there again, team performance. Um, so the positive aspects is obviously the better our team is, the more cohesive our team is. Um, uh, the better they're going to perform, they're going to be participative, uh, they're going to support each other, make sure that it's a, a collaborative uh, environment. And typically we see this in, in big software companies. So open plan offices, uh, people sit around open plans, they listen to each other. Uh, if a younger staff member starts going astray, a senior staff member typically listens in and uh, helps the junior consultant to go the right way. In the construction industry, it's not always that easy. Um, becomes a little bit more uh, difficult to manage. On the negative side, however, uh, lack of cooperation or unparticipative, you know, um, keeping the knowledge only to yourself, scared of, of, of sharing the experience, scared of uh, sharing the technology, um, low performance even from staff members, um, and then of course clicks, uh, really difficult uh, to manage, um, and then dysfunctional conflict typically because you've got different types of personalities um, that's going to you know, influence how you're going to deal with different types of people. All right, so that's basically all that I wanted to say for tonight. Um, the information that we spoke about tonight uh, specifically deals with, uh, I think it's question number two for assignment number one, uh, assignment number two. So you should be able, if you have a look at the slides, if you have a look at the questions, um, there's not enough in what we did tonight to answer the questions, but at least there's enough in there to go and do a little bit more research, do a few searches, and uh, you'll be able, or be able to be in good shape for assignment number two. All right, so do you guys have any questions? Uh, no, I'm pretty good, thanks, Josh. All right, so I can see Zane, you don't have any questions. Uh, Wayne, you also don't have any questions. Um, Philip, it's your first session. Um, what do you think? Is it something? Uh, uh, can you hear me, Joshua? I can yeah, yeah, me? we can. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. I've yes. never been through this process before. Um, I can see the benefit of doing it like you're, the way you're doing it. Um, in my experience as an engineer and architect, I would say that uh, getting the management style right for a um, site 
manager is very important because uh, if you get on the wrong foot from the start, you're, you're going to have a struggle with our team right through the whole process. So it's important to develop a style and try to get feedback from the people that you work with, especially when you're young and you're out on site, just to see how you handle you know, the situation. Oh, great. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, for that. Brent, Brenton, what about you? Um, yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Um, one about question two on assignment two. Um, mm -hmm. if, it, if questions are finished on the presentation. Yeah, um, that's fine. Let's yeah, go for it. I, I was just going to say, uh, just regarding the multi multidisciplinary organisation, um, is it uh, specifically towards construction, like a multidisciplinary consultancy or construction company, or is it up to us to choose, or are we meant to try and keep it as loose as possible to um, leave it open to anyone? Is it, or are we meant to basically create our own company overview and then? describe what that is and then write this accordingly to it? Uh, good question, Brenton. Yes, uh, you can. It, it's, the, it's a card blanche question and that's why I sort of left it nice and open. Um, if you think about uh, you know, your career and everybody that's studying with you, not everybody is going to stay in the construction industry. I think uh, of all the students that finished with me uh, in 1994, only about 12 or so of the uh, class of 50 is still you know, involved in construction. So uh, for that question, if you go for a multidisciplinary organization in any type of industry, be it marketing, international logistics, publishing, software development, anything like that, what you need to do is make sure that you do a nice write-up and say, this is the, the organization that I've got and uh, this is the type of business that I'm working in. And uh, you know it can be hypothetical, or alternatively, you can base it on on the organisation that you're working in. Let's say you work for a tier two or a tier one uh, construction company. That might be a, a good way of uh, making the question nice and easy for yourself. But if you if you don't if you don't operate in that in that area, um, you know you're welcome to use a hypothetical scenario as long as you you know. For both cases, just write it up and make sure that I understand the assumptions that you've made. Awesome. Um, the other quick one was all the previous posts and chats have been hidden now, so we can't we can't go back and see what sort of marks we got for them and that sort of stuff. They sort of die after a couple of weeks. I know. Oh. Or Okay, so you can't see them anymore. Um, I'll fix that tonight. I didn't know that they disappear. Um, what I wanted to do there is just make sure that everybody posted and then not post later on. But what I might do is I might just take away the um, the time limits on all of those um, indefinitely because let's let's face it, I'm not going to apply the penalties on those postings. Um, so thanks for thanks for notifying me. I'll fix that up tonight or tomorrow morning. So by tomorrow or so, you'll be able to see that again. Wonderful. Thanks, sir. That's good. Okay. Thanks, Brenton. All right. So any more questions from anybody? No, I'm all good. Thanks, Josh. All right. So uh, yep. If we don't have any other questions. I might just stop the recording over here. We'll post a notice update so they do. Ah, so somebody started the recording.